this video we will look at special factoring. There are several formulas that may help us to factor. The first one, and probably the easiest one, is the difference of squares. Remember when we multiply two conjugate brackets with the same terms, but opposite signs, the product becomes the difference of the first term square and the last term square. Now we are going to use this formula the other way around. As soon as we recognize the difference of squares pattern, we are going to factor it into two conjugate brackets. So let's see how it works. In the first example we have difference of x square and 121 is actually 11 square. So if we recognize this we can prepare two brackets, use the terms under the square, which is x and 11, and just use different signs, plus and minus, and we're done. So it's really easy to apply this formula. Let's check the next example. We see a difference, and as soon as we realize that these two terms are actually perfect squares of something, we can use difference of squares formula. So is that a perfect square of something? Yes, it is. It's 5a square. And the last term is really the same as 8b square. So we can use the two brackets and use our terms that we see under squares. So it's 5a and 8b, 5a and 8b, and then place plus in one bracket and minus in the other bracket. Okay, let's see the next example. Again, we have a difference and x to the 4 can be considered as x square squared and 625 it's actually 25 square. So yes, we have difference of two squares. Again, prepare two brackets, one with plus, one with minus, and let's use our terms that we see under squares. So it is x square for the first term and 25 for the second term. That's great, it's factored, but is it factored completely? The first bracket is sum of squares. We mentioned before that sum of squares is not factorable. However, the second bracket is still a difference of squares, so we should factor it farther. Let's copy the first bracket, x squared plus 25. However, the second bracket can be factored into two more brackets, x plus 5 and x minus 5. We should factor completely. Okay, let's see the next example. Again, we have difference, but do we have squares here? Well, 20 is not a perfect square, that's for sure. So remember what we're supposed to do first is to check if we have any common factor. If we do, we need to take it out. And in this case, yes, we have common factor. It will be 5 for sure because it factors 20 and it factors 125. So let's take 5. And the common letter is Y. So what's left inside? Well, we have 4x to the 4, and then second term minus 25y square. Now let's look at this bracket. Do you see difference of squares again? I hope you do. So let's factor it farther. 5y and prepare two brackets. One with plus, one with minus. The first term is a perfect square of 2x square. So we use this for both brackets. And the second term is a perfect square of 5y. So that's our second term. Since we can't factor neither of those brackets any farther, that's the complete factorization then. Okay, let's see example E. Now we have difference of two things. Is that a perfect square? Yes, it is. It's a square of this whole bracket. And also 100 is a perfect square. So we can factor it as before using two brackets, one with plus, one with minus. The first term under the square is the whole bracket x plus y, x plus y here and there. And the number under the square in the second term is 10 because 10 squared is 100. So here we go. We have our factorization into two trinomials. The last example in this bunch is, again, difference of two squares, because 49y squared is a square 
of 7y. And in the second term, we have a square of x minus 3. So let's use the same rule, two brackets, one with plus, one with minus. The first term is easy, it's just 7y. However, the second term is a bit longer, so we have no problem when writing in the plus bracket, but if we write after the minus, we need to use an extra bracket here. So our x minus 3 must be placed in a bracket because of this minus, red alert here. Finally, let's rewrite this question by releasing the inner bracket. So we'll have 7y plus x minus 3 times 7y minus x and plus 3. Here we go. It's good to remember that sum of squares is not factorable. For example, x squared plus 9 is prime, can't be factored. We already experienced the sum of squares in example C. x squared plus 25 is prime, so we don't even attempt any further factoring here. The next very important formula, something that you must remember, is called perfect square. And it comes from squaring binomial, either the sum a plus b or the difference a minus b. We already foiled these two examples in one of the previous videos and we experienced this formula. However, now we need to be able to recognize the pattern of a square plus or minus 2ab and plus b square in order to fold it back to the perfect square, like on the right hand side, either of the sum or a difference. Here on the side we can look at geometric justification, why this formula works. If we take a segment of the length a, which is here, and a segment of the length b, which is over there, and we place it perpendicularly, again segment a and segment b, we can span a square with the sides a plus b here and there. So a plus b when squared actually gives us the area of the square. How else can we see this area? Well, we could cut the entire square by using those connecting points between a and b segments, cut it this way. So the whole square is cut into four smaller shapes. The blue shape is a square with side a, so its area is a square. The green shape is a square with side b, so its area is b square. And we also have these two brown shapes, which are rectangles with the sides a and b. So the area of each of them is ab. Since there's two of them, in the formula we have 2ab. Okay, a square represents the area of the blue square, b square represents the area of the green square, and 2ab, double the product, that's the area of the two remaining rectangles. So when we add all those areas, we really have the area of the square with sides a plus b. So that's a geometrical visualization of our perfect square formula. Now, I will suggest that you write this formula on a piece of paper and place it on your fridge so you can look at it as often as you can. You really need to memorize this formula. You're going to use it very often in mathematics. Okay, let's try to apply these formulas as the next factor strategy. So, we need to factor this trinomial. Remember, the first step in any factoring is check for common factor, and if there is one, pull it out of the bracket. So, in this case, the common factor is 2, and then what's left in the bracket is x squared minus 14x plus 49. Now, we have a trinomial, and since the outside terms are really perfect squares, this is x squared and this is 7 squared, well, we should suspect that this trinomial may represent a perfect square. We just need to check if the middle term is actually the same as double the product of the outside terms that we see under the square. So double the 7 and x. 7x, double it, yes, it's 14x. That means the middle term really complies with the formula. So we can fold it back, copy the two, and fold it back to the perfect square of 
and we list those outside terms that you see under squares, so x and 7, with the middle sign, so minus, and the factorization is done. So it's actually not too difficult as long as we are able to recognize that this trinomial is a perfect square of something. To convince yourself that this really works, why don't you raise to the square using the formula and check if the answer matches the trinomial that we started with. Okay, let's see the next example. We have a trinomial, this is a perfect square of b, and that's a perfect square of 4a. If the middle term is double the product of those outside terms that were squared, then we can use the perfect square formula and fold it back to the perfect square of the sum. Well, let's see. 4a times b and double it, yes, it is 8ab. Therefore, we can fold this whole trinomial to perfect square of the sum. We're taking the middle sign, so the sum of 4a and b. Okay, let's look at the next example. It doesn't look like we have any common factor, and we have a trinomial with outside terms being perfect squares. That's a perfect square of 9n, that's a perfect square of 8m. We just need to check if the middle term is double the product of 9n times 8m. 9 times 8 is 72, when we double it, it's 144, and we use n and m. So yes, it is a perfect square, therefore we are squaring these two terms, 9n and 8m, connected with the middle sign, which is plus. Perfect square of a sum. Okay, let's look at the next example. Maybe this time try to do it on your own. Remember to check for common factor first. What is the common factor? Well, we could pull the x out and we could also pull the minus because it's better to start with a positive term in the main bracket. So let's take negative x out of the bracket and then we have 9x squared y squared, switch the sign so it's minus 30xy and plus 25x is gone, right? So just 25. Now when we look at this trinomial, the outside terms are really perfect square. So that's 5 square and this is 3xy square. We just need to check if the middle term is double the product of 3xy and 5. Yes, it is. 3 times 5 is 15, double it is 30xy. Okay, so we can fold it back to the perfect square of 3xy, use the middle sign, minus, and 5. That's all. In the next example, it would be good to think globally. Think about this whole bracket as a new variable. So we have something square minus 2 times something plus 1. Well, that's exactly perfect square formula. First term square minus double the product of the two terms in plus one square. Well, we can fold it back into the perfect square of difference because of this middle sign. The last term is one square, so we use one. And the first term is the whole bracket square, so we use whatever is in the bracket. Here we go, it's factored. The next example is a bit harder because we have a polynomial with four terms. So the first thing that comes to my mind is, let's try some grouping. And we talk a bit about grouping two by two, but in this case, there is no chance that grouping two by two would work, because in the first group, we have only x as a variable, and in the last group, we have only y as a variable. So no matter how we factor later on, these two remaining brackets will not have a chance to be the same because they have different variables. However, there is another way of grouping. Grouping of the first three terms and the last term. How do I know that this may work? Well, first of all, this minus may indicate that if the first group is by any chance a perfect square, and we can see that the last term is also a perfect square, we could think about difference of two squares. So if we see a perfect square here and a minus in front, there is a big chance that the first three terms will actually constitute a perfect square. Is this really a perfect square? Well, let's check. Here we have a square of x, 
and the last term is the square of 8. Is the middle term double the 8x? Yes, it is. So yes, it is a perfect square. Let's fold it into the perfect square of x. We use the plus sign and 8. So that's the first three terms. And now we have minus and let's rewrite this term as a perfect square of 4y. Okay, so now we can see difference of two squares and we can use the formula from the first slide. So we prepare two brackets and the first term x plus 8 here and there and then plus or minus the last term which is 4y here and there and we're done. So it's a beautiful question because we can apply three factoring strategies grouping, perfect square and a difference of squares. When we look at the last example, perhaps the hardest one, well, we still have four terms and no common factor, therefore we should use some sort of grouping strategy. And we have a minus here, so we have similar situation and the last term is perfect square. But when we look at the first three terms, oh, they don't constitute a perfect square. Just because the middle term would involve a and b and there's no b square in the first term. So that doesn't work. 2 by 2 also doesn't work because the first two terms involve only a's and the last two terms involve b's as well. So that doesn't work either. Maybe we can group the first term and the last three terms. This is probably the hardest question to observe the pattern. Why? Because in order to see a perfect square in those last three terms, we actually need to pull the minus out of the bracket. Then we'll see a little bit better. Let's do it. So I'm going to rewrite 25 as 5 square in preparation for difference of squares pattern. So 5 square minus and then in a bracket it's a square minus 6ab plus 9b square. Now if it's written that way we can mole, we can see a lot easier that this trinomial really constitutes a perfect square of a minus 3b square because 3b times a is 3ab and double it yes it is 6ab so the middle term confirms. Okay let's rewrite it nice and clean we have 5 square minus a bracket a minus 3b squared. So now we can use difference of squares formula prepare two brackets use different signs plus here and minus there and use our terms so 5 as a first term and the last term is the whole bracket Remember to write it as a whole bracket, especially here after this minus. So in this bracket, when we have a plus, the small bracket doesn't really have to be written. It will be just a minus 3b. However, in that bracket, when we have a minus, red alert, remember to place a bracket for the incoming expression if it's longer than one term. So we have here a minus 3b. Okay, and for the last step, we just need to release this inner bracket and leave the answer as a product of two trinomials. 5 plus a minus 3b and 5 minus a plus 3b. Well, I showed you a lot of examples. Now it's your time. Take some problems from the textbook and see if you can do it. The last type of formulas that we need to know is the sum or difference of cubes. So, how does it go? The sum of cubes factors by using short bracket and a long bracket. In a short bracket, we write exactly the same terms that we see under those cubes. And we use exactly the same sign. When this is written, the long bracket is nearly the same as perfect square formula. However, we don't have the double at the middle. So we go first term square then switch the sign into opposite, product of the two terms, but do not double, and last term square. The last sign is always positive, because when we square any number, positive or negative, the result is positive anyway. Okay, the second formula, difference of cubes, works nearly the same way, except that the short bracket contains the minus, so you copy exactly what you see under those cubes and use the same sign in the first bracket. In the long bracket though, we take the square of the first term 
then we switch the sign, the sign is opposite, right? Product of the two terms AB and finally add the perfect square of the last term. The second bracket in cubic formulas is not factorable. So don't confuse this with perfect square formula, which is factorable. Another way of memorizing those signs is in each formula, we have only one minus. Either it is in the first bracket, so it's not in the second, or if it wasn't in the first, then it will be in the second by the middle term. Okay, let's try to apply it. To factor x cubed plus 1, we will consider 1 as 1 cube, so we really recognize sum of cubes. And then we prepare short bracket and a long bracket. In a short bracket, we write whatever is under cube, so it's x plus 1. In a long bracket, we take the first term that we see in a bracket that was already written down. In the long bracket, we take the first term that was just written down and square it, so it's x squared. Then we switch the sign, the sign will be negative now, and we multiply the two terms, so 1 times x is just x. Finally, we add perfect square of the last term, so it's just 1. And it's done. Next example, let's realize that 8 is 2 cube, so we can see clearly our terms that we're taking. In the short bracket, we will have 2 minus n. The long bracket, we already refer to the terms in the short bracket. So, the first term square is 4. Switch the sign, opposite sign, so it's plus. Product of the two terms, and plus last term square, n square. And it's done. In the following example, first let's realize that those are the perfect cube terms. So the first term is actually 4a cube, because 4 cube is 64. By the way, 64 is a very nice number. It's perfect square, it's a square of 8, but it's also perfect cube, it's a cube of 4. So we use whatever we need in a given situation. And then the last term it's really the same as 3b cube. So our terms under cubes are 4a and 3b with a middle sign which is minus. Now in the long bracket we take the first term, we square it, 16a square. We switch the sign, so it's plus. We take the product of two terms, so it's 12ab. And we take the last term square, so it's plus 9b square. And that's it. So please practice using those formulas so you can be more familiar with them. Okay, in the next example, the first thing that I would do is to pull the minus out of the bracket. And then this is x cube, this will be plus. If I want to see this as a cube, I may want to write this as y square and then cube it. So now I have minus and in a bracket is a sum of two cubes. Let's keep the minus, prepare two brackets. So we are going to use the first formula. Short bracket and a long bracket. In a short bracket I have x and plus y square. In a long bracket I square the first term x square, switch the signs, so it's minus, product of the two terms x y square, and add square of y square, so it's y to the 4. Okay, next we have sum of two cubes. This is cube of the whole bracket and this is cube of 5. So again, short bracket and a long bracket. In a short bracket we have x plus 1 as a first term, then this sign plus, and 5 as a second term. In the long bracket we'll have the first term square, so it's x plus 1 bracket square. Then we switch the sign, so it's minus, product of the two terms, we need to use a bracket here, 5 times x plus 1, and finally plus last term squared, so it's plus 25. Okay, so this time we have a little bit to do in the second bracket. We need to use the perfect square and release this bracket and collect like terms. Let's see. In the first bracket we can collect these two like terms, so we have x plus 6, in the second bracket, let's perform this perfect square formula first. So, square of the first, x squared, plus double the product, 2x, and plus square of the last, 1. Then distribute the 5, so we have negative 5x and negative 5, finally plus 25. And we need to collect like terms. 
So let's write this underneath. We'll have x plus 6, and then in a big bracket we'll have x squared, and then we have 2x minus 5x, that's negative 3x. And finally, 25 and 1 is 26, minus 5 is 21, plus 21. Since we end up with quadratic trinomial here, we should ask ourselves question, is this factorable any farther? Well, the product 21 and the sum 3, that's impossible. We can't have two numbers that multiply to 21 and add to 3. Therefore, that's the end. This is the final answer. We can't factor it any farther. Finally, example f. Again, this could be considered as difference of two cubes. If I will write x square and then cube it, minus y cube and then cube it, then we see clearly that this is really difference of two cubes. Okay, so let's prepare the short bracket and a long bracket. In a short bracket, we take the terms as they are under cubes, so it's x squared minus y cube. In a long bracket, we take the first term and square it, so it's x to the 4, change the sign, and then we multiply the two terms, so it's x squared y cube. Finally, we add square of the last term, which is y to the 6. And that's all what we can do. In the last few examples, we need to factor completely. That means use any of the strategies that we learned so far. Okay, let's see the first example. We have four terms. We don't see any common factors. Can we group them in a useful way? Well, let's try to group them two by two. From the first two terms, we may pull y to the 4 as a common factor. What's left is y plus 1. From the last two terms, we may want to pull negative, and then we'll get y plus 1 again, which is great, because now we can factor this common bracket out. And what's left is y to the 4 minus 1. But then y to the 4 minus 1 can be easily considered as difference of squares. So we can factor it farther. Copy the first bracket, prepare two brackets, and the first term under the square is actually y square, and the last term is 1. 1 plus 1 minus. Okay, sum of squares is not factorable, but difference of squares we can still factor. So let's go farther. We copy the first two terms, y plus 1, y square plus 1, and then this is a difference of squares, it factors into y plus 1, and y minus 1. So we factored everything that we could. But we could still rewrite this in a more concise way. For example, these two brackets can be written as a single bracket square. So starting with y square plus 1, and the next bracket we can say y plus 1 bracket square, and finally y minus 1. So that will be the more concise answer. Let's look at the next example. Again, we have four terms. Do we have a common factor? Or oh, yes, we do. The 5 is common. So let's take 5 out and then see what's left. This will be x cubed minus x squared y minus xy squared plus y cubed. Can we do something about this? Well, let's see if factoring by grouping would work here. Let's try to group 2 by 2. That will be 5. Let's open a square bracket so we can finish our work inside the big bracket. Okay, from the first two terms we can pull out x squared as a common factor. What's left is x minus y. From the last two terms we could pull y squared or negative y squared. Think for a second what's better. We need to end up with x minus y inside the bracket. Oh, so let's pull the minus out as well. Negative y squared, and inside the bracket we'll have x minus y. Okay, complete the square bracket. In the second line, we may want to pull this x minus y common bracket outside of entire expression in the square bracket. So we'll have 5. We don't need to write the square bracket anymore. That will be just x minus y bracket. 
and then what's left is x squared minus y squared. But we see that this is a difference of squares, so we can factor it farther. Okay, so it's 5x minus y, and then we'll have x minus y and x plus y for this difference of squares. Obviously, these two brackets could be written as a perfect square of a single bracket. So this could be left as 5x minus y squared and then x plus y as a final answer. The last example is even longer. It has six terms. But the good thing is, if you look at the first three terms, that really constitutes a perfect square. Perfect square of 2a minus 1. You can check on that. So that's great. And here we have a minus. So we may wish that the last three terms also constitute a perfect square. But in order to see it, we should first pull this minus out of the bracket. So we'll get 2a minus 1 square and then minus in a bracket will have b squared minus 6b and plus 9. Okay, so that looks like 2a minus 1 square minus and this whole bracket is another perfect square formula. That's b minus 3 square. Okay, let's write it down. b minus 3 square. Now we'll look at this expression as a difference of two squares. So prepare two brackets, one with plus, one with minus. Okay, and we write the first term, 2a minus 1, and the last term, b minus 3. Okay, b minus 3. But in this case, since we have a minus here, the b minus 3 must be placed in a bracket. Finally, we want to release this inner bracket and collect like terms whenever possible. So in the first bracket we have 2a plus b and then it's negative 1, negative 3, so it's negative 4. In the last bracket we have 2a, we'll have negative b, and then we'll have negative 1 and positive 3. So 3 minus 1 is plus 2. Here it is. This was probably the hardest question.